Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Franzen. We would like to thank you for joining us today for this webinar, a production of Dataversity, with our speaker, Nick Pendar of SkyTree. Today, Nick will be discussing machine learning techniques for analyzing unstructured business data. Just a few quick points to get us started. Due to the very large number of people that attend these sessions, you attendees will be muted during the webinar. We will be collecting questions in the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, however, and we encourage you to do that. Um, you can also use the chat window to send me messages if you need. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information that may come up during the webinar. All of that will be posted at dataversity.net within two business days. This webinar is part of a series, and we look forward to seeing you at future uh, webinars in the Smart Data Webinar Series, but also the archived collection is available at dataversity.net as well. And now a few words about our speaker. As a natural language processing expert, Nick Pendar applies machine learning and data mining techniques to textual data in order to classify, extract, and organize information from a variety of sources. Nick received his PhD from the University of Toronto in 2005, and in the same year started an academic position at Iowa State University, where he conducted and directed research on NLP and text categorization for various educational and legal purposes. Prior to joining SkyTree as a senior data scientist, Nick also held engineering and R&D positions at Groupon, Uptake, and H5. He has published papers and given numerous talks on the topic of NLP to a variety of audiences for over 15 years. He has also filed multiple patents and is an active member of several related professional organizations and conferences. Please join me in welcoming Nick Pendar. Nick, welcome. Thank you, Eric, uh, for that great introduction. Um, uh, yeah, so today, uh, instead of uh, basically listing a, providing a laundry list of different techniques that we use uh, in text analytics, I decided uh, to uh, introduce some of the techniques that are available and then go a little bit deeper in one of the techniques that we recently used at SkyTree for a specific problem. That way we can get a, a highlight of some of, the, some of the available techniques, but also kind of get into the details of uh, essentially what, what amounts to data preparation for uh, machine learning using text data uh, in the context that I'm going to uh, provide. So without further ado, let's get to it. So I'm going to go through the introduction, talk about uh, some of the uses of text data, where text data comes from, and uh, then get deeper into the case study that I'm going to talk about uh, talk about the challenges of training data and uh, provide the experiments and the conclusions. Um, so, yeah, over the last uh, few years that I've been working with text data and doing text analytics, I noticed that, you know, there's like two general sources of text data, internal and external to any organization. You know, internally you have email and you have chat communication, uh, all sorts of internal communication across uh, team members in an organization. Um, also, people publish white papers, they patents, other kinds types of IP papers. Uh, there's also business documents that uh, get get produced, like notes, uh, purchase orders, um, and also machines produce lots of data. Uh, for instance, you know, if you have a if you have a large system, usually those systems, uh, computer systems, they produce a lot of a lot of logs, uh, and uh, those machines need servicing. So people service them, and then they produce notes of what happened to these machines, and a lot of other technical data. Um, and obviously, you can think of other sources of text data within an organization, and. Uh, People throw out numbers, things like almost 80% of, or maybe up to 80% of an organization's data comes in unstructured textual form. 
On top of that, you can add the external data sources, things like the web, everybody's familiar with that, social media, news, uh, public records, you know, electronic health records if you're into healthcare, um, professional pub uh, publications if you are an R&D shop, uh, libraries uh, if, you are, if you are a knowledge worker. So there's lots and lots of text data that uh, we have available to us. And the speed uh, that this data is accumulated and the sheer mass of that it makes it impossible for anyone to, to process it and to, to ingest it in any meaningful way. Um, so this is when uh, people resort to machine learning in order to make sense of the text data that they have. And uh, you can kind of categorize the types of uses of text data into three, you can say uh, a recommendation or search. For instance, uh, you're interested in you know a, a document that is relevant to you. So basically, you're asking the system to show me a document that is relevant to me, uh, and this could be in response to a query such as you know a Google search. So you have an information need, you type in your query, and you get some document that's relevant to you. Uh, sometimes you have a number of documents and you are interested in documents that are similar to this. Uh, this comes up in a variety of contexts, for instance, in, in any exploratory analysis. Um, or you, want, you are interested in documents that people like you are also interested in. Um, this could be for personal uh, enrichment or for uh, professional purposes. Another form of uh, use case for text data is categorization and e-discovery. So essentially, you want to show, show me, you want to see documents that are specific to a topic. Um, the in, in all of these cases, the machine learning techniques that we use for these involve some form of classification. Uh, for instance, if you are under litigation and you're uh, required to provide documents that relate to marketing practices here and there for a particular product. Basically, you're asking the system to classify documents whether they, they belong to the topic you're interested in or not, or they are close to the documents that are in, in, of your interest or not. Um, sometimes an organization is interested in deleting a number of documents. They don't want to keep everything around. They don't want to keep duplicates. They don't want to keep old documents around. But there are, but they're also legally obligated to, re, uh, to retention of some of the documents. So they're interested in finding the documents that are basically either duplicates or they are they do not belong to any IP or anything where they 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 might be required to provide those documents in the case of a litigation. So that's another form of classification. Basically, this document can be deleted or not. And then there is uh, this vast, uh, basically, sea of analytics. It's, it's, an, it's a vague form. People talk about text analytics in a variety of different forms and contexts. And essentially, you can say, you know, what is X thinking about Y? What is my cu customer thinking about my product, uh, for instance? Um, or why did my customer make a certain decision? For instance, you know, why did my customer leave me? Or uh, why are people closing their accounts with us or, or coming to us or whatever? In these contexts, uh, we're we still using classification. We're, we're still classifying documents in terms of, you know, is this relevant to this topic? Is this relevant to a customer? Is this, a, is this document related to a customer leaving or not? And on top of that, we are using uh, classical NLP uh, techniques and information extraction techniques to extract information from a document after we've classified that it is of interest to us. Um, so when you look at all of these use cases, in the crux of those, we have a classifier. So basically, a document has been classified uh, for in terms of whether it's related to your topic or not, related to your use case or not, and so on and so forth. And that is that makes sense because people are generally 
classifiers at heart. So whatever whatever we do uh, every day, we are basically classifying things constantly over and over again. You know, I'm walking down the street and I, somebody's approaching me and I classify this person as friendly or not. You know, I'm hiking and I'm stepping on rocks and I'm classifying these rocks as whether they're good foothold for me or not. So thinking of uh, problems as classification problem is just natural for people. And also uh, uh, it's um, basically a good way to get rid of unnecessary data so you can focus on the data that's, that's relevant to you. Um, there's another word for classification in machine learning. It's called supervised learning. And uh, the reason for that is usually uh, we collect some data for which we know labels. For instance, uh, documents that are related to sports and documents that are not related to sports, if our uh, category of interest is sports. We collect these documents uh, whose labels we already know. Somehow we train a classifier. The classifier learns a pattern of, in this case, you know, the lexical patterns of these documents. And uh, at this point, the classifier is able to predict whether a document is related to sports or not, given new documents, uh, considering its past history. So that's why we call it supervised, because we are providing some labels for the classifier. Um, and the cleaner the better data you have to provide your classifier, obviously you get better a better classifier. However, the challenge lies right there. Finding clean data, data that doesn't include a lot of errors um, and is relevant, and also data that's enough. You know, you don't want to give your classifier only a handful of examples and ex expect it to perform well on new data because you might not see enough patterns in, in that data set. Um, so oftentimes, even all of the time I would say, uh, the job of a data scientist uh, most of the time is spent in finding the data, cleaning the data, and preparing it for a supervised machine learning algorithm. Um, so, how do we do that? Uh, in this case study that I'm going to uh, discuss right now, uh, we had a we had a client that come that came to us. They had access to the entire Twitter firehose, and they were interested in classifying each tweet into a number of categories. Basically, they wanted to tag all tweets that came to them. And they wanted to be able to store those tweets and then provide a dashboard to their clients and show their clients relevant tweets. And when you look at tweets, we get 500 million tweets a day, about 150 million of those tweets are in English. And the challenges of processing uh, that type of data set, you know, uh, as, a, as anyone who has heard the, same, the term big data knows, you know, it's the data size and the velocity of the data. Um, another challenge is that tweets are very short, and that means people use uh, acronyms, alternative spellings. Uh, sometimes they're so short that they contain no signal in terms of the, the classifier. And uh, given that Twitter is uh, basically live and people talk about uh, things that are happening to them right at, the, at this moment, the data is also very dynamic in, in, in nature. Topics pop up, uh, over time they change, and sometimes they even completely disappear. So uh, training a classifier for tweets is extremely difficult. Uh, and another challenge is that we, we don't have training data for these topics. Um, tweets have been around for only so for only so long. We don't have training data for uh, regular topics like sports and finance, and uh, for new topics that emerge, we definitely don't have any training data.
So how do we create training data? This is the, this is the crux of the problem. Uh, we are interested in training a classifier, but we don't have any data to, to give to our classifier to learn from. Um, there are several, several approaches you can take to find training data. One is you can say, okay, I'm going to hire some people, give them some tweets, and uh, train them uh, for, for a class and say, you know, if, if you see this, these types of tweets, they all belong to sports and others don't. Um, usually this sort of thing uh, is, is accurate. You get pretty good training data for it, but it's extremely expensive. There's not a scale at all. It, it, it only works for uh, smaller data sets, uh, for cases where you really need human judgments, uh, for instance, the cases where uh, the topic is extremely difficult. And uh, in cases where the topics don't change as much. So that, that approach would be out the window for us. And one approach that we looked at was, why don't we use hashtags? Uh, people use hashtags to uh, label their tweets for topic or other things. And uh, we might be able to use hashtags, maybe cluster hashtags, and find uh, topic markers there. Maybe some, some kind of pattern would emerge. There's actually very interesting research uh, for clustering and uh, finding patterns in hashtags. Uh, we looked at it, but it turned out that hashtags are extremely noisy because people have used hashtags uh, in a, lot, a variety of different ways. I don't, I don't know if you can call it abuses. They just use it for their own purposes, not for uh, tagging tweets for a class. Uh, so you can you have hashtags that are uh, hashtags like TBT, you know, Throwback Thursday or hashtags that uh, apps put in to link back uh, users to their, to their app. Uh, a lot of different hashtags that actually don't mean anything in terms of the category. And those provide enormous amount of noise into our data that it makes it almost impossible to, to get any useful meaning from them. Uh, so after... Uh, short period of looking at hashtags and trying to cluster them and finding topics, we decided to abandon that because it was it was too noisy. It's a good research topic, but it's it's not useful. It wasn't useful at least for us in that context where we were working with a with a client who wanted who wanted a production system. Um, another uh, approach is you, you, let we can we can say okay let's do let's find a set of keywords that are not ambiguous. We are sure that those keywords uh, signal a topic, for, for instance, soccer, pretty much all the time means that uh, we're talking about the sport. Um, and especially in the context of tweets, uh, you know, the occurrence of one or two of these words would be enough to signal that this tweet is about sport first, for instance. If I see soccer and basketball, the tweet is definitely about sport, nothing else. Um, so we can say we can, I'm going to collect a number of unambiguous keywords, use those keywords to search through my data set. Anything that contains those keywords would be uh, positive examples for my class. Um, that is also accurate relatively because you're using unambiguous keywords, but it's hard to, to curate. How do you find an ambiguous keyword and how many is enough? Uh, so you get low recall. If you, if, how, it doesn't matter how, how many keywords I have uh, accumulated. Uh, I'm not guaranteed to um, to have a high coverage of all of the relevant keywords. Um, and the last approach is let's find a comprehensive keyword set. So we want, we're going to make a very large keyword set. Um, it will have noise in it. Definitely, because if I have a large keyword set, some of those keywords might be ambiguous. But at this point, we are hoping that uh, machine, uh, machine learning techniques that we're using would p be able to pick up the signal from the noise and train a good classifier. 
So we decided to go uh, to take that last approach, create a comprehensive keyword set. And uh, now the question is, how do we come up with these comprehensive keyword sets? Again, we cannot go to people and ask them to give us comprehensive keyword sets because that will be the problem number one. It's very expensive. Um, so we decided at this point to uh, find keyword sets using some external knowledge source. You know, things like Wikipedia. People have already put a lot of effort in Wikipedia or, or Freebase, uh, things like that, where there is a lot of knowledge available already curated by people. Let's uh, make use of that knowledge and create a keyword set from that. Another approach is to find unambiguous uh, hashtags or Twitter handles. Uh, unambiguous hashtags and Twitter handles are good. They don't give you enough coverage though, but uh, using a knowledge graph such as Wikipedia and extracting keywords from a uh, knowledge graph would give you a lot of keywords and relatively good coverage. Uh, so, for example, in this case, what we did was we trained classifiers for sports and NBA. Uh, but see, uh, we created keywords, as I take that back. We created keyword sets for sports and NBA by starting a crawl uh, of Wikipedia articles uh, at, the, at a node like sports or at NBA, and then collecting all Wikipedia title articles and treating, the, treating those articles as uh, as keywords. So for MBA, we got something like 10,000 keywords, and that gave us about a 1% yield of uh, the data that we had at our, at our disposal. That gave us a good coverage. But um, like I said, the challenge here is, is again that these keywords are not necessarily uh, completely unambiguous. There's, there is noise in there, and we're hoping that the classifier will pick up the noise. So for example, some of the keywords that we collected for MBA, these are names of, on, on the left hand side you can see the names of players, names of uh, NBA teams. For sports, we got a list of uh, names of sports, you know, things like Aikido and, and aerobatics and things like that. So I have a number of keywords. What do I do with them? Um, we, we're going to define that any tweet that contains these keywords would be positive to my class. So for my MBA, any tweet that contains those names of MBA players or, or teams would be my positive tweet. Or for sport, any, any tweet that contains, um, you, can, you can even score that. In this case, we just went binary and we said, you know, any tweet that contains the name of a sport would be related to sport. So far, so good. What about negative examples? Uh, so we assumed that any tweet that does not contain any of those keywords would be negative. So that's one way. Uh, this is not true in general because our, we, we, there is no guarantee that our keyword set is complete. So there could be tweets that may be related to our topic, but we just didn't have the keyword for it. Another way was to basically train a kernel density estimation model on the tweets that we deemed as positive, and then, and then, and then estimate the probability distribution of any other tweet and say whether this tweet belongs to that distribution or not. Tweets that did not belong, that was had a very low probability of belonging to the same distribution as our positive set, we deemed them as negative. So we did, we did two experiments. One experiment was uh, our negative set would be a uniform sample of anything that did, that was not positive based on our definition. Uh, and another another experiment was. Uh, so our negative set was selected from the uh, tail of the distribution based on the kernel, kernel density estimation. 
Uh, it turned out that actually the kernel density, kernel density estimation approach uh, resulted in a worse model. Uh, so we went with the with the first approach. Basically, any tweet we're going to, we're going to sample air from the any tweet that did not contain our uh, keyword set. So um, let me step back a little bit and uh, review this approach because there was a lot of detail there. Uh, visually. So we had an initial concept, for, instance, for example, MBA. Uh, we identified a keyword set using our external knowledge source like Wikipedia. We came up with an initial keyword set. Uh, things like names of NBA, NBA players and uh, NBA teams. And then we searched uh, our unlabeled documents, our unlabeled tweets. For these, uh, for the occurrence of these keywords, and we defined uh, anything that contained those keywords as positive, anything else that didn't contain them as negative. So this is our training data right now. Um, but we didn't stop there. We said, okay, we're going to now uh, treat this as a, a supervised text classification problem and identify features from from this set. Uh, identifying features from this set basically means that you create a dictionary of all the words you see in this data set and compute a score for how significant is this word in terms of signaling my category. So now we are essentially extending our initial keyword set by a factor of basically it's several orders of magnitude. The keyword set goes from 10,000 to maybe a million, uh, and each word now is not binary, basically, uh, does it occur or doesn't it occur? Uh, each word now has a weight in terms of how many times I've seen this word in positive or negative tweets. Um, at which point, now we're going to represent these tweets in a machine learning friendly way, and now I have a data set that is ready for machine learning. So I haven't done any machine learning so far. But as I said, you know, the most of the time of data scientists is spent in preparing data, especially when you're dealing with unstructured data sets. This is where the bulk of the problem lies. Now I have a data set that's ready for machine learning. But at this point, we, uh, we trained the machine learning model. Uh, and the goal of this was we want to train a machine learning model that is good enough uh, in the beginning to put in production so that whatever it says belongs to the category actually belongs to the category. I'm not too worried about missing things. Uh, but over time, as we get more and more data uh, with user input, we can uh, enhance our training set. And with a better training set, we can retrain periodically and we will improve the model over time. So we train a model based on the occurrence of single words and uh, single word and two word sequences. And we use uh, this feature that SkyTree provides called auto model, basically say, uh, you know, find the best parameters for the best model and just train a model for me. Uh, and for this experiment, we optimize the model for precision at top 25%. Basically, I asked the, the software, to train a classifier such that the top 25% of whatever it says belongs to the category actually belongs to the category. Um, so once that happened, we actually got pretty good precision and recall on cross-validation data, on the data that we created. Uh, in this table, the first column, the threshold is uh, basically the probability threshold that we use to say whether something belongs to the category or not. This is on sport data. Um, precision is the percentage of the tweets that it said belong to the category, actually did belong to the category. And recall is the percentage of the tweets that we wanted to capture. And as you see, we get fairly good precision and recall on this data set. Uh, but we shouldn't celebrate yet. I know we have confetti and balloons up there, but we shouldn't celebrate yet. Because 
this data set we created uh, artificially. We, we said anything that contained these keywords was positive, anything that didn't is negative. So given good results on this type of uh, training data is not a surprise. So uh, the question right now is, does this model actually work on new data and uh, does it go beyond the keyword set? Basically, the question, the question I'm asking right now is, I trained a classifier, but am I doing any better than just using those keywords? Uh, so we, at this point, we had this model, we gave it some completely new, completely unseen data. And then we looked at how the classifier performed. And it turned out that the classifier actually, because it, were, it had uh, built this extra dictionary that was much larger than the uh, initial keyword set, it, it had captured uh, a number of interesting, interesting patterns in the data. For instance, uh, in the context of NBA, it had picked that McAdoo is a, base, is a basketball player. Um, me not being a sports fan, I didn't know any of that. So I actually had to go and search and figure out what it is that it has picked up. It has learned that Al Jefferson is a basketball player. And in the sports example, I couldn't find any single uh, lexical item that would signal NBA, but uh, it's a collection of, this, of those terms that told the classifier that this is a likely NBA uh, term, tweet, rather. Um, we trained another model for the topic machine learning. And uh, the system learned that latent semantic analysis or latent semantic indexing, LSI, is a term related to machine learning. It learned that hidden Markov models in data science are related to machine learning. And these are, these are keywords and phrases that did not occur in the initial keyword set. So it looked like our system was learning something beyond, uh, beyond the initial keyword set. Uh, which was the goal. We, we, we didn't want to just uh, have a static keyword set and uh, stop there because, uh, especially in tweets, topics change, as I said before. Uh, so we ran another experiment just to make sure. We said, how about we get this keyword set, we remove one of the keywords, we train the classifier, and we see if it picks it up. Uh, so we train the classifier for sports but we removed the word baseball from our initial keyword set and did the same. We trained the model, we ran the model on new data, and uh, we saw if it, it had picked up the word baseball, which it did. Uh, there were a number of tweets where it said, where the only signal in the tweet was the word baseball. Same thing for NBA. We trained, we trained a topic, we trained a model for the topic NBA without using the word NBA and it picked up that that word is significant. Uh, and all of that comes from the fact that uh, we are doing feature selection after after creating the training data and the feature, the features contain a lot more keywords than where we started with. So to conclude, uh, basically creating a training, training set, especially for large data sets, uh, and for difficult topics is, an, is a daunting task. In this particular case, we were able to uh, leverage Wikipedia, and it's, it's usually good, good advice to go look at, you know, what other people have done and try to kind of make use of that. In this case, Wikipedia, uh, uh, crowd, crowdsourced type of knowledge uh, that we were able to use. We trained a model for high, high precision that we could use in production. At the same time, this model was performing well enough that was going beyond the initial keyword set and was able to be uh, to be retrained uh, and uh, to get improved uh, over time. Uh, and at this point, I I stop and I will open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so. Uh, a couple of questions have already come in. I'll remind people to please go ahead and uh, drop those questions into the Q&A module in the lower right-hand part of your screen. Uh, Nick, to start off, right around slide 16, a question came in asking how we test the results. Oh, this. 
um, there is there is a common technique called cross validation, uh, when where you are where you divide your data set up into say five five folds, you train a model on four of them, you test on the fifth, and you repeat until all of your data you've used as training and as both test sets. Uh, and these numbers are based on that, which uh, actually would be, in this context, in this study, this would be misleading because, um, because we have selected the data officially and uh, any data that contains a set of keywords would be positive, anything that doesn't would be negative. So it's not a surprise that we get, we get good results on there. That's why we f went further ahead and did those tests on unseen data. Okay, our next questioner says, thanks Nick for this clear explanation so far, but don't we need to create a lot of variables on the data under research? Isn't that even more difficult than preparing a good training set? Um, let's see, uh, let's see if I can understand the context of this question. Uh, we need, so the, the, the variables that we, created here where on this slide, uh, the right-hand side box identify machine learning features. That's where we are creating the, the dependent variables for our training data set. Um, and that is the vari that's a variable set that's bigger than our initial keyword set. Is this the context of the question or was it further back in the initial Slides. No, it, it came in later. Um, a real quick question in the meantime, uh, if, in case that questioner would like to uh, post a clarification. Um, this question is, please repeat what recall means. Oh, a recall means um, the percentage of, of the items that we wanted to capture and we captured. Uh, so, for instance, if there are 5,000 documents that we were expecting to capture and we got half of those, we get 50% recall. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you talk more about how you get from topics like the NBA to initial keywords using Wikipedia? Absolutely. Um, so for NBA, uh, we we start. So this is this is the semi-manual piece of it. We start at the topic NBA at Wikipedia. You can you can kind of search for it and find the best match for NBA. Now you have now you have the starting point, and then at that point you crawl Wikipedia and you collect the Wikipedia articles that are linked down to some depth like five or six steps. That way you get, you collect a large number of, a large number of these keywords. And then you can do some, uh, some computation on the frequency of things and, and repetitions that I didn't go into so that you get a clean, uh, a cleaner keyword set as opposed to anything that you see. Okay. And we actually got a couple questions asking about tooling. What technologies and tools were used in this project? Um, okay, so for some of the aggregation, uh, we were using Python uh, for, for the aggregation of the data, uh, for the aggregation of the keywords that we were using dumps of Wikipedia and Python code uh, in order to, to get the training set. Once we got the training set, uh, the feature selection, the right-hand side uh, box on the slide again, that we use SkyTree software for. And the machine learning aspect of it, the auto model and the smart search on this slide, these are SkyTree software. Okay. Um, that is all the questions we have at the moment. I'll give people a couple minutes to uh, add any more in. Um, I was curious, were there, what, what kind of human resources 
would be required within an organization to run this kind of a, a program? Um, uh, definitely a data scientist, I would say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and um, so the data scientist would help uh, frame the, the problem, would help uh, scope it and uh, basically create the training sets for it, or at least at least advise on the collection of the data. And at that point, if you get into human annotation of the data, then you might need some subject matter experts depending on depending on the domain. So, for instance, in, if if you're in the legal domain and you're doing e-discovery, you probably need need to have access to paralegals or people who are, who are well versed in in the legal domain to say whether a document is related to a litigation or not. In healthcare, uh, you probably need a health a healthcare practitioner such as a nurse to, to tell you whether you know a for instance a, a record contains uh, a certain type of medication or a certain type of disease or not. Or, or if it's uh, just regular business data, you probably need uh, people who can tell you whether, for instance, this place is a restaurant or a hotel or a spa, things like that. Um, so that's when you need human annotation. A lot of times, um, data scientists uh, use their colleagues as human annotators. Basically, they say, hey, how about you label some data for me? And, and at that point, they, they try to get the labels from multiple people so that um, they mitigate some mistakes and uh, collect high quality data. And beyond that, there is, uh, if you want to put things in production, obviously you need software engineers and systems engineers to to build uh, the infrastructure that's necessary, uh, build or buy the infrastructure and uh, the software that's necessary for it. Okay. Um, the next question is, can embeddings from RNNs, and I'm assuming the questioner means the recurrent neural networks, um, Possibly, uh, possibly even on a character level, be used for semantic reasoning? And if yes, from which layer and how would you repeatedly construct dense vector representations of sentences? Uh, the short answer is yes. Yeah, there is research on that. Uh, people are using the RNNs for semantic analysis. Um, the problem usually is, the, the, the challenge is that you need a lot of training data for this sort of thing, mm. and the computational cost of this approach is, is high. Uh, but in general, the RNNs work work well, uh, and uh, and and you know, if you, if you have enough computational resources, uh, you get you get good results. Okay. Uh, next question: Can ontologies be used to substitute or in conjunction with keywords for classification? Um, supposedly, the ontologies capture certain amount of semantics, which might help in the analysis. Um, yes, the ontologies are very useful. In fact, you can think of Wikipedia as kind of an ontology. Uh, it's, a, it's a graph more than an ontology, but in general, yes. However, uh, the nodes on the ontology, each one should be associated with a set of keywords in this type of context where you want to search for the occurrence of the keywords, because I imagine you know a, a note in the ontology is itself just a phrase, and uh, use and searching for that one phrase would not be useful. Uh, you might you might uh, take a similar approach to us and uh, start from a note in the ontology and uh, and every other note that's underneath that down to a certain depth. That might be an approach uh, worth taking a look at. Okay. A uh, request here, can you talk more about how you get from keywords to machine language, uh, to machine learning features? Um, so for every keyword, we know how many times we see this keyword in a positive document and how many times we see it in a negative document. There are a number of statistics you can, you can calculate based on this, this information. Actually, without even without that, you can calculate term frequency times inverse document frequency, uh, or TFIDF. Uh, TFIDFs give you a good weighting in terms of the 
the importance of the words in, in the in the corpus, or you can calculate more informed uh, weights for each feature, and uh, that would be based on the occurrence of the words in the positive and the negative set. Uh, binormal separation is a good example. Um, Chi-square is another uh, good one. Odds ratio. There are a number of statistics you can calculate on these. So at this point, once you calculate a score for every word, you have a dictionary, and for every word in the dictionary, you have a score. At that point, you can represent uh, a document as a vector, and in uh, the high-dimensional vector, uh, this approach is called the vector space representation of a document. Uh, and in this vector, at each dimension of the vector would correspond to, to one of the words in your dictionary, and the value of that would, would correspond to perhaps the frequency of occurrence of the word in the, in the document multiplied by its, by its weight that you calculated in the previous step. Uh, at this point, each document will be represented as a high dimensional vector, and uh, now you have a matrix that you can feed your machine learning. Okay, a question here about um, the positives and negatives that you were talking about. Do you reclassify some negatives to positives or positives to negatives based on the new keywords found using ML? Um, yes, so as, as time goes by and uh, you get new data, uh, essentially you can add uh, well, this is this data is, is time sensitive. Uh, so as time goes by, you you probably want to refresh the training set uh, altogether. But as time goes by and you get uh, you get new data, and uh, and based on the user user interaction, whether you, know, you can ask users whether this actually is related to the topic or not, or based on the fact that they click on it or not, you can make a decision that uh, this new document or this new tweet that I saw is actually positive or negative. And at that point, you can collect more data and uh, add it to your training set. Um, or you can use some kind of active learning approach where you are, you're making your classifier ask for clar clarification. The classifier trains a model, goes through a new set of data, and then looks at the, picks the data that is closest to its decision boundary data that it's most uncertain about and present those to a user and say, hey, how about this? Uh, is this related to, to my topic or not? And uh, at that point, you can add, uh, you can get, take the user input and add it to your training set, which in effect means some of the things that the classifier says would be negative might end up, be, might, might end up being positive or vice versa. So in a manner of speaking, the short answer to that would be yes, but you probably want to work, do this on new data that's coming in so that you're also getting fresh data. Thank you. Is a classifier equivalent to a feature in the context of a keyword? Um, a uh, no, the, the the classifier looks at the features, looks at the keywords, and finds patterns in those. Uh, so, no, those would be two different things. Basically, a feature would be one of the inputs to a classifier. <clears throat> How do you handle negations, such as those often found in disclaimers? Ah, good one. Um, in this context, you really don't need to handle negation because um, we, are, we are classifying for topic. If somebody says, I like soccer or I don't like soccer, they're talking about soccer nonetheless, especially when you're talking about tweets, which, is, which are very short. Uh, you could think of, it, think of a case where somebody says, oh, my document is not about sports, I'm going to talk about something else. And in those contexts, again, because we are only interested in a topic, uh, the lexical patterns would, would lead would basically signal the topic, regardless of negation within the document. However, there are cases where negation might matter, for instance, in, a, in the context of sentiment analysis, where somebody says, 
you know, I love this hotel or I don't love this hotel and things like that. And at that point, um, using a, there are several approaches you can take. One of them is uh, you, you can use a nonlinear classifier and you make sure that the negations are in your feature set and a nonlinear classifier would, t would pick up patterns, the, the co-occurrence patterns of, of these negation words and the, the other words. Uh, and uh, basically will we'll mitigate the problem. Another approach is um, you can featureize your document not as a complete bag of words, but, a, as, but a summation of bag of sentences, for instance, where you maintain the locality of the negation and the words that are surrounding it. Another approach would be to use uh, engrams, like sequences of words, and that would include those negations. And at that point, uh, but that would that would require a lot of data. Um, if you don't have enough data, engrams would probably not be useful. So there, there are several ways. Um, you might. Uh, in some other problems, you might even want to try to parse the sentences uh, and uh, try to capture the fact that a negation uh, was present close to a verb in a sentence, for instance. Uh, those are those are more involved, and uh, usually they take take out a lot of time uh, with diminishing ROI. So I would start with just a simple bag of words, and then incrementally make the System more complex as I as I need to. All right, thank you so much, Nick Pendar of SkyTree, for this great presentation and Q and A. Uh, I am afraid that is all the time we have for today. Um, just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to Dataversity.net in the on-demand webinars section within two business days. And I will also send out a follow-up email to all registrants to let you know how to access that material. The next Smart Data webinar will be on the second Thursday of November. That's Thursday, November 12th at the same time. And our topic will be related to a semantic solution for financial regulatory compliance with Michael Bennett of the EDMC, the Enterprise Data Management Council. Thank you all again. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thanks to all of our attendees for being here today, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. My pleasure. Thank you for your time.